God, our Father in heaven, we love you. We know how much you love us. Thank you for everybody that's here who's on their way. Thank you for the other classes as we change to a new quarter. Help us to exalt you through your word to learn, to deal with each other in humility and in love, and to grow to be more like Christ. As we study the book of Revelation this quarter, help us to learn the message, to grasp it even in its difficulty and strangeness in some ways. And most of all, help us to know the victory we have in Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so this quarter we'll be studying the book of Revelation. And really, we're going to do it over two quarters, so we won't have to rush. Um, I don't know that that's going to make me talk any slower, but we're still. <laughs> we're going to try to do Revelation chapters 1 through 12 in the first quarter, and then we'll go from 13 to 22 in the next, or somewhere about there. We'll try not to get too bogged down, have an overview of some of the chapters and really deal with some of the content that's there. Today's class I'm hoping serves as basically an introduction. I've got some stuff prepared on chapter one if we get that far. I don't think that we will though, but if we do, that'll be fine. Just kind of want to set the table for how I'm going to go about teaching the book and some background information and some things that I think will help us to study the book and also kind of create some discussion on um, the book of Revelation as a whole, some things we should keep in mind. All right, so I know we can't know everything about the book of Revelation, but there are some things we can know. And if you have a quiz, go ahead and start taking that quiz. If you don't, don't worry about it. In about five minutes, I'm gonna read these questions off and we'll do it together. I've got a quiz just, well, let me say something about the quiz before you start on it. I've got two purposes for this quiz. One purpose is to say, you know more about the book of Revelation than you think. And the other part of this quiz is to say, we've probably read some things into Revelation from popular news and books and media that really aren't in the book. And I hope this quiz and this class is gonna help clear up some of the confusion. So it's about, how many questions? I don't know, I forget, 16? All right, 16, yeah, so it's a multiple choice. And um, for the most part, if you wanna go ahead and circle some of those, and then I'll just read it out loud and we'll go through it quickly for everybody, and then we'll get into it. I printed out four. I'll take it back to you, but you can go ahead. Yeah, no. <laughs> Not I'm going to take that and we're going to read, well, don't run the because I'm going to read the answer to the question. Y'all got a family one right here. Oh, yeah. She's got glasses. 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 What is that? How did you see it? I can show her some of the glasses. Your house is coming. Yeah. It is coming. It's 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 coming. All right, um, let's see. Maybe five more minutes. Are y'all making progress? Yeah. Some of y'all starting as soon as you came in, but that's okay. It's not open book, by the way. I forgot to say that part. Um, yeah, this is about y'all are like cheating your soul away, right? Silence for bids in the script. If you didn't okay? tell so, us that we Yeah, no open book. This is just supposed to be off of the memory. I don't. I'm going to read them. I printed 40 of them. I probably should have done more, but in the future, we'll do better. I'm going to read the quiz, and we're going to take it together in about five minutes, so don't worry. Thirty-five. We'll go ahead and uh, go over. 
Neil's going to print out some more worksheets so people can at least have the blanks where we'll start doing that. How many don't have one? Do not have a worksheet? Not the quiz, the worksheet. The worksheet. About four up here on the front. Okay. All right. All right, I'm going to go over the quiz and um, then we'll hopefully Neil will be back in time. So here we go 16 questions. I'm going to read all the questions and then we'll talk about the answer. So, number one, what is the correct title for this book? Revelation or Revelations? So we should probably just drop the S, right? It was never there to begin with, but we do kind of carry that in sometimes. Revelation. All right. Um, where was John when he heard and saw these things? A, island of Cyprus. B, island of Melita. C, island of Crete. Or D, the island of Patmos. Patmos. Patmos, that's right. All right, number three. Select all the churches that are not a part of the seven churches addressed in the book. A, Thessalonica. B, Smyrna. C, Pergamos. D, Lehman Avenue. E, Ephesus. F, Thyatira. G, Jerusalem. H, Pergamos. And I, Philippi. So who do y'all got? Not a part of the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. Lehman Avenue. Avenue for sure. We got that one. Okay. What? Thessalonica is not in there. Jerusalem. <laughs> and Philippi. Pergamus is one of the seven. What was that? It's oh. an answer clause. Still not one of them. <laughs> 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 All right, number, just number four. How many seals? Number four. How many seals are on the scroll in the hand of the one on the throne? This is from Revelation chapter five. A seals. What seals? B six, C ten, or D seven? Seven. seven. All right. Number five. How many were sealed from the tribes of Israel? What do y'all got? A one thousand, B twelve thousand, C one hundred and forty-four thousand, or D ten thousand? I hear. Yeah, C, 144. All right, the one who prevailed to open the scroll looked like a A, man, B, shepherd, C, bear, or D, a slain lamb. Yeah, a slain lamb, D. All right, number seven. So far, so good. Number seven, what is the number of the beast and the number of a man? 911. This is kind of a trick question, by the way. Seven, 144,000, 666, or 777? 666 is right. However, and we'll see this when we get to the chapter dealing with the number, there are some manuscripts, and this is probably, it's a possibility your English translation may even have this in the footnote. Some manuscripts have 616, and so there's something about that there. I've worked at Taco Bell, and people would come through and they'd order food, and if their total came up to 666, they'd like throw a side of sour cream or something. You know, they can't have this negative. Okay, but anyway, they were worried about it. Number eight. Out of what was the street of the great city made? A, gold, B, platinum, C, topaz, or D, diamond? Gold, that's right. All right, D. The book of Revelation is A, a prophecy, B, apocalyptic literature, C, an epistle, or D, all of the above? All of the above. And you learn that in the first three verses. The first thing John says is it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. That's an apocalypse. And then it's the word of prophecy in verse 2, and down in verse 4, he says, here's the message to the seven churches. It's a letter. That tells us about how to read the book. Sometimes people approach Revelation and they say, well, it's apocalyptic. Can't understand any of it. But it's also an epistle. And we can understand a lot about the epistles, but more about that in a minute. What number are we on? Number 10. How many times is the Old Testament directly quoted in the book of Revelation? A, 0 to 5. B, 10 to 20, C, 30 to 40, or D, more than 50 times. What do we got? Old Testament quotes, direct quotations from the book of Revelation. What do y'all say? Y'all were rocking and rolling a minute ago. You know, like, <laughs> Lehman Avenue, 144. How many we got? I want to say C. C. The answer is A. The Old Testament is not directly quoted at all in the book of Revelation, though there are many allusions, like things that it appeals to from the last half of the book of Daniel, Zechariah, there's some things from the book of Exodus, but John never pulls a, 
this is what was written in the Old Testament throughout the book of Revelation. That doesn't mean anything. It probably relies on the Old Testament more than any other book, but there are no direct quotes from the Old Testament. Number 11, almost done. Which of the following is not found in the book of Revelation? The fiery red dragon, the seven-headed beast, the Antichrist, or Babylon the Great? A. A. A is not correct. It's the Antichrist. The Antichrist is mentioned in 1 John, but people just assume, well, it's the end times. Here's the last thing John says. And John never mentions the Antichrist in the book of Revelation. We just kind of think he does because we're thinking, no, he doesn't. He mentions the fiery red dragon in chapter 12, the seven-headed beast in chapter 13, Babylon the Great throughout, but the Antichrist is not mentioned. Number 12, what two Old Testament figures are mentioned in Revelation? Elijah and Moses, Daniel and Zechariah, Miriam and Esther, or Abraham and Joseph? A, in Revelation 11, there are two witnesses they resemble Elijah and Moses. Number 13, what is the most prominent number in Revelation? 7, 666, 1,000, or 144,000? 7, yep. 14, what did John say would happen to and for people who read this book and keep this message? They would struggle to understand it. B, they would be blessed. C, they would be smart. Or D, they would slay the fiery dragon. They would be blessed. B is the correct answer. Two more. And this is personal. This is just, I'm just wondering about this. 15. How many times have you read Revelation in your life? The whole book. A, 0 to 5. Who would that be? Raise your hand. 0 to 5. See, if it's 0, I'll put you in there with everybody. Nobody knows. That's all right. B, 5 to 10. You say 5 to 10 times. C, more than 20. D, once a year. E, every day. We got Gary Bratcher in the back. He's fighting some dragons and beasts every day. All right, then 16, 16, you can do that one on your own, okay? I just wanted you to kind of have your own summary of what the book is all about. So based on the quiz, how do you think you did on the quiz? Who thinks they did good? Who thinks they didn't do good? If you don't think you did good, don't worry. We're all gonna learn something. Nobody knows everything about the book of Revelation. And if you say, well, I did pretty good, um, I'm sure you'll learn some things too. I want us to remember this book is for you. You can learn the book of Revelation. You don't have to be a Greek scholar. You don't have to be a church historian. You don't have to be an Old Testament expert. Those things will help you. But you don't have to be those things. And I know that's right because the people that John wrote to, many of them in the first century, over half of the first century world, was illiterate. They would have an individual get up and read the book. And I know it was in their context, but God didn't give us a book that we just would be totally lost on. And so I do want us to take courage that we can do it. All right. So some ground rules for the study. Like I said, we may get to Revelation 1 today, but we're going to do some kind of introductory stuff. So here's some ground rules, and I'm going to appeal to these throughout. When somebody does something, I'm going to say, hey, remember the ground rules. And in keeping with Revelation, there are seven of these for how we're going to go about the study. So here's number one. I'm going to say I don't know a lot, okay? So you're going to ask me stuff, well, what is this sign? Well, what do you think that means? And sometimes I'm just going to tell you, I don't know. I don't know everything about Revelation. I've tried to study it intensely for a long time, but that doesn't make me an expert. So you're going to hear, I don't know a lot. Number two, we're going to focus on the truth of the book. When we run into false ideas and false doctrines that are propagated by the book of Revelation, we're going to address them, but I don't plan to spend all of our time talking about how people misuse the book or what people don't understand about the book or they teach this about the book. There are some places where that just happens, right? The thousand year reign and those sorts of things. But this whole class isn't going to be about what everybody else misunderstands about the book of Revelation as much as what is John revealing for us to learn. And that's how I think we ought to study the Bible regularly. Number three. You are expected to contribute in the class. So you'll get the most out of this class if you, at the end of every class, I'm gonna tell you, it won't be more than two. I'm gonna say, read this chapter or read these two chapters for the next class. And I'm gonna have a list up here if you wanna participate in this at the end of the class to write your email. I plan to email out the questions on Friday. You can do this on a Saturday night. You wanna read through the one or two chapters, answer the questions, you'll be more prepared. You'll get more out of this class if you participate yourself and work through the book of Revelation with us. I know. We're not used to homework and Bible classes, but it's a new day. All right. All right. This is the next one. You can't hijack the class. So there are two kinds of people in a Bible class on Revelation. Some people are terrified. They want no part of Revelation. And then some people know everything about Revelation, and they want you to know they know everything about Revelation. And I'm okay with that. I welcome your feedback and participation, but I want everybody to participate. I don't want any one person to answer all the questions, give all the comments. And I know we're going to forget this. I'm going to remind us about it. I'm going to overlook your hand and go to other people because 
everybody needs to participate and everybody needs to try to learn something so that we can um, wrestle through. I know sometimes there's a question posed and there's this awkward silence and we want somebody to rescue us from it. That's okay. It's all right to wrestle through the thoughts and try to figure out, I don't know, what does this symbol mean? What is he talking about here? And hopefully we can do that. Interpretive decisions. There will be sometimes several different interpretations on the side or on a symbol. And I'm gonna to try to give you the best that I think that it is. You may disagree, that's okay. I think we can still get the overall message of the book, even if you and I don't see eye on every interpretative decision. But just remember, it's my responsibility and every Bible class teacher to teach you what the Bible says. It's not my responsibility to teach you what the brotherhood has always believed or your favorite commentator, or we sing a song that mentions this, surely this is what it means. I'm really interested in what John says. And if that makes us uncomfortable sometimes, hopefully we'll learn together. I think. There are two more. I want us to see Jesus as the hero of the book. And the last thing is, I want this to be faith building. I believe it's a Bible class teacher's responsibility to build faith and not diminish it. I want you to walk out of every class more confident of what you know and believe about Jesus and not more unsure. I don't want to raise a bunch of questions and then just leave the table that way. I want us to be anchored in the truth of the word of God every time we leave the class. And so I hope the class will be faith building. If you feel like we're getting in the weeds and getting off course, Remind me of the ground rules because that's the purpose of this study. It's not for me to teach you everything, to show how smart I think I am or anybody else is to say, here's John's message of victory to the church and here's how we can be better served by following. Okay, now you've got your hand out. Here's some questions for reflection. How many sermons or Bible classes, or let's just do sermons. How many sermons do you think you typically hear on the book of Revelation? Do we hear a lot of preaching on the book, would you say? Who sat in a Bible class on Revelation before? I'm, I know there have been some, yeah, through the years. We don't really deal with the book of Revelation a lot, and I want to talk about why. So let's go through this. Why do you think we generally avoid the book of Revelation? Maybe you don't, but I, I've heard of churches doing this. They'll say, we're going to study through the New Testament this year. I've heard of congregations starting at Matthew, getting to Jude, and just turning right back around and go to Matthew. <laughs> I've heard of Christians saying things like, well, Hiram, I don't really read the book. It scares me. I don't know if they think something's going to jump off the page and grab them or what. But there, I, I couldn't understand. I don't know. And so what would you say? Why do you think? Give me some of the reasons why you think we generally, maybe not you, but surely I'm not in the dark. Surely you've heard, show of hands, people that don't read the book, we can't understand it, it's difficult. So why is that the case? Why would you say we generally overlook, Mike? Apocalyptic language, first century, it, it confuses people with all the, okay. the animals and creatures and yeah, we don't think we can understand it. Why is that a problem to say that? Well, we can't understand the book of Revelation. What's problematic about that? Because you already gave up. You already gave up before you got started. That's a big problem. But what else? God's the author. God's the author. If God's given us something, what's the title of the book again? Revelation, Revelation which means to reveal something. It's a problem if God gave us something in this and I'm going to make it in such a way that you can't understand it. Now, I know people have said this about the book of Revelation. I don't know if this is true, though. Well, John wrote an apocalyptic language so that if a Roman or somebody else intercepted the book, they wouldn't be able to understand it, but the Christians would. John doesn't say that. I don't know how steeped in Zechariah and Isaiah Roman guards were anyway, but John's writing in the genre in which he is for a reason. There's something about apocalyptic language throughout the Bible which says, Kingdoms are falling and God's kingdom will rise, stay with him. And John speaks in this kind of comic book fashion to get it across to us, but we can't understand it. Don't think just because you can't understand everything that you can't understand anything. Sometimes we go through the first three chapters, some stuff to the seven churches, some cool stuff in 20 through 22, and we just kind of leave four through 19 alone. We don't have to do that. I hope this class will help us to see that. What else would you say why we generally stay away from the book of Revelation? What would you say? Just because they're seeing it as something to come. More about that in a moment, Miss Stacey. Yeah, some people they're afraid of it. They think what's going on in the world, it might apply to that or something along those lines. Any other reasons? Okay, let's go through a few. So that's one we don't think we can understand. It. Number two, we know there are different views of interpretation. So it's like, look, all of these smart people can't figure it out. I've heard a lot of different views. How can we be sure? I mean, there's so many conflicting. They say it's about this. He says it's about that. How can I really be sure? I think sometimes the various interpretations kind of run us off from even giving it a try. Here's another one. We think it's about the future and we want practical application. So how many times have you heard, I want practical application in preaching and teaching? I think this is about the future. Uh, but just think about this. John wrote to the seven churches where? 
in Asia in the first century, what good would it do to write to them in the first century about things that wouldn't happen for some 2,000 years? Are there futuristic parts of the book? Well, we'll talk about that when the time comes, but do you really think people suffering in the first century at the hand of the Roman emperor, and I'll talk about who wrote it and what time I think John wrote the book, but that he was really concerned with Obama or Putin or Trump or Russia and just spaceships and well, the book of Revelations about the coronavirus and all these things people just introduce into the book. Sometimes we don't read it because we think, well, it's future. But then there's another problem. We want practical. And so we love Romans 12, we love Colossians chapter 3, we love the Sermon on the Mount, but the book of Revelation, at least we think, is not practical, but nothing could be further from the truth. I'm going to show you this quote from Nancy Guthrie in her book on Revelation, a short little book called um, Blessing, and this is what she says about this practicality as it relates to the book of Revelation. I think it's helpful. Don't squint, I'll read it to you. If we're concerned with what's practical, the day will come when we will look back and it will be clear to us that there was nothing more practical than prayer, nothing more practical than perseverance, and nothing more practical than praising the triune God, even when evil was pressing in on us. We will discover that worship was the ultimate rebellious activity, enduring our allegiance to King Jesus, even when it cost us, and living as if we don't expect this world to applaud us, approve us, or satisfy us, is rebellious. It's shocking. And at the same time, it is the ordinary Christian life. It is what is expected of a citizen of the kingdom of heaven living in the kingdom of the world. She's saying, you might think the book of Revelation really doesn't hit us, but in the end, the day will come and we'll see the things John mentions. Just worship and prayer and living the Christian life, it doesn't get much more practical than that. It really is what the Christian life is all about. And so if we feel like, well, we want more practical, the book of Revelation is exactly what we need. And then here's the last one. I think it's partly we're unfamiliar with persecution. And the book of Revelation, turn to Revelation chapter 6. Look at Revelation chapter 6. And the first person that gets there, just read Revelation 6, 9 and 10, nice and loud for us. Revelation 6, 9 and 10. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord? holy and true until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. I don't know if we we haven't been. Of course, these are people that have been martyred for their faith, but we don't pray for it like that. And maybe the book of Revelation and its intense emphasis on persecution rubs us the wrong way in our sort of cushy and padded lives. And we ought to thank God for the blessings we have when we talk about being able to worship God free from persecution. I pray it's always that way. The Bible doesn't tell me to pray for persecution because it's going to make me better. But when it comes, we should welcome it and be the people God wants us to be. But maybe Revelation doesn't sing with us as much in our hearts because persecution is foreign to us, at least this kind. We are persecuted in some ways, but not in the ways that they were. And so because of that, we might struggle with this content. But if we were being a sale for our faith on a daily basis, like many of our brethren throughout the world, if we were worshiping in secret in China or something along those lines, John's message of people holding on and realizing that they're winners even in the word in which they're despised, would mean a lot more to us. I don't think we've got to wait till we get to that point for it to mean something to us, but this may be part of the reason why we can just, well, live our whole Christian lives, and occasionally we might get to the book of Revelation, maybe we won't, but if our lives really depend on this message of victory, and they do, whether we know it or not, I think we would spend more time with it. All right, and so I think those are some of the reasons we generally avoid it. Now, let's talk about some of the reasons on why we should study it. Suppose somebody was saying to you, I can't understand the book of Revelation. It's too difficult for me. What would you say to them to try to get them to study the book? What would you say are reasons why you should study Revelation? Because what, what would you say? It's in the Bible. That's a good place to start, Jeremy. It's in the Bible. So 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, Paul says, All scripture is what? It's God breathed or it's given by the inspiration of God. If that's all we could say, that would be enough. God gave it to us. It's in the Bible. And so we should study the book because God wants us to study it. Any other reasons why we should study the book of Revelation? It's helped me to understand the persecution that the first century church was in. Okay, yeah. It helps us to understand the persecution that other people are dealing with. Any other reasons? It's going to help us. First century, yeah. yeah, I think it will. It'll help mm -hmm. us. Here are some other reasons. We should understand, try to understand it, even if we don't think we can get everything. Ephesians 3, go there. I know this isn't in Revelation, but Paul wrote to the churches in Ephesus, and so, or John included them in the seven churches, so I guess they're, they're okay. But go to Ephesians 3, and somebody else, read 3 down through 5. 
Ephesians 3, 3 down through 5. I know Paul's talking about the book of Ephesians, but I believe his message here appeals broader than just the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 3, 3 through 5. How the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That's how Paul describes Revelation. Not the book of Revelation, but the process of the revealed message. He's saying, he received it by Revelation, we don't. God revealed it to the apostles and prophets that way, but they wrote it down. But look at verse 4. So that when you read, you can do what? Understand. God wants us to understand the Bible. We should read it because even though we can't get everything, maybe get our hands around every symbol and sign, we can get some understanding from it. Here's the second thing. We really need to see our world from heaven's perspective. We've got such a limited view on what's going on. John Piper says, God's probably doing 10,000 things in your life, and you probably know about three, right? And so in our lives, we really need to zoom out. Revelation helps us to do that. It helps us to zoom out and say, look, I know you watch the news. You've got your job, your family, your neighborhood, even your little congregation, and you're tempted to think that's all there is. This is all that really matters. And John's saying, there's heavy stuff going on. And you need to see the world from heaven's perspective because a lot of people in the world look like winners and they're really losers, according to God. And a lot of people in the world look like losers, but according to God, they're really winners. In 2 Kings 6, this is in the days when Elijah was prophesying and the Syrians are battling Israel and he's got a young man with him, a servant. And you remember the servant says, we're going to be outnumbered, we're going to be destroyed. And Elijah prays. He says, there are more that are with us than with them. And then he prayed to God and said, open his eyes so that he can see what I see. And the book of Revelation helps us to open our eyes. We look at our world and we say, you got LGBT, you got Pride Month, you've got the political, you've got all of this political upheaval, you've got our world just going, and we're just, I don't know what's going to happen to us. And Revelation says, God is not sleeping on the job. He knows exactly what's taking place. Nothing catches him by surprise. And he's been doing what he's been doing a lot longer than we've been worried about it. And the book of Revelation reminds us of this. Romans 8, 31 through 39 if God be for us, who really can be against us? And Revelation reminds us of that. Russell, did you have your hand up? I was going to say, for, for us as Americans, I think Revelation is really hard. Because we're really not persecuted. We can do what we want. Unless we really try to do it exactly what God wants us to do. Then we may be persecuted. But not like they were. Yeah. So there is a difference. There is a difference. But again, I don't think we necessarily want to. I mean, I don't think we need to invite. I, some people think they're not really being a Christian until they're persecuted. Paul says it's going to come to everybody, 2 Timothy 3, 12. And it comes in different ways. We don't have to have a martyr complex where we're always running for our lives. But some opposition is healthy for our faith, I think. And Revelation emphasizes that. Here's another reason to study Revelation. To be reminded that there is spiritual warfare. How often do you think about this? We talk about our sin and we talk about our struggles. But how often do we think about the fact that there really is unseen, there really are unseen spiritual forces at work in our world? I know the miraculous agencies that has not stopped the devil and what Paul calls the principalities and powers of the world from working. And we don't see these things and we don't think about it enough. But how often do you really think about genuine spiritual warfare? That your soul is so valuable that heaven and earth are at war over. One soul, your soul, means so much that the devil and God are in battle over possession of it. And the book of Revelation reminds us that spiritual warfare is a reality. And then the last thing is we can receive the blessing. Look at Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, and I'll read this one. Notice what John says in verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written, for the time is near. So John says there's a blessing attached to reading the book of Revelation, and we miss out on the blessing when we don't read the book. Um, and, of course, he says some other things there, too, about keeping what is written, for the time is near. But would you ever reject the blessing that God's offering? We should take up and read because John says there's a blessing attached. And then the fifth thing Bobby mentioned already, it's not on the screen, but... We need to live out the message in our own day. And so because of that, we should study the book. All right, helps with studying the book, and then we'll get into some background study, and we might actually have time to get into some of chapter one. All right, here are some background tips, some things that'll help us. What would you say if you could have one tool that'll help you study the book of Revelation? You might not have this. 
you may feel like you won't get to have this in your life, but what would you say is one thing, if I had knowledge of this, or if I could do this, I would be way better at understanding the book of Revelation. If you could pick your tools, if you said, I know some, or I don't know a lot about Revelation, but I think if I had this, then I would be a better Bible student when it comes to Revelation. What do you think is going to help us study the book? What are some tools we think we need? I know we've got our English Bible. we got to read it. That start, it starts there. But are there any tools that you think, if we had them in our spiritual tool bag, we would be better readers of this book? Ms. Kim? Well, we might need a teacher. I don't know if I'm going to be able to help you. We're going to do what we can, though. <laughs> understanding of Daniel and some of the other Old Testament. Okay, yes. I would say that's at the top of the list, Kathy. Knowledge of the Old Testament. If we knew the Old... So John doesn't quote the Old Testament directly, but then he alludes to it some 267 times. 267 references out of 404 verses. John's in the Old Testament saying things. But here's the thing. And we're like, John, you really didn't help us much. John alludes to the Old Testament, but then he doesn't mention a lot of the stuff we know from the Old Testament. He's in Zechariah. He's in the back half of Daniel, Daniel 7 through 12. He's in Ezekiel. And we're like, well, he didn't give us anything from Genesis. Like, he didn't give us the stuff we normally know. But if we knew the Old Testament better, I think it would help us a lot. If this is all you had, you don't need Greek, you don't need church history, if we knew the Old Testament better. Because in Revelation, what God basically does is plugs in his album and plays his greatest hits. And he says, here are the things I've done before. You remember the Exodus? It's like that. You remember the plagues on Egypt? It's just like that. You remember Daniel and how the nations are described as beasts and Christ's kingdom would crush them? It's just like that. And he just reminds them of these things that they can and should know. I thought there was another hand somewhere, though. Yep, go ahead, Ronnie. Not only we read something very we that's a good point. Ronnie says you got the New Testament. And I, that is a good point. I didn't think about that. But John can't introduce anything into the New Covenant that's foreign to the other 26 books. And so a knowledge of even the New Testament will help us to round out some of the things. Here are some other helps, unless we have some other comments. Use of our visual imagination. We don't really use our imaginations much. A lot of the epistles is just do this and do that. But John doesn't tell us what he heard. John tells us what he what. So he saw now that's different. We live in a visual world, we live in a HD society, and John starts saying, you gotta use your imagination. I saw a beast coming out of water, and then I saw a person with a book, and one foot was on the land, and one foot was on the sea, and I saw a dragon. You gotta use your imagination. And if you're not inclined that way, I'm really not by nature. It, it's kind of a struggle because we feel like, oh, this is just crazy. God gives us permission not to add to his word, but to use our imagination visually to grasp what he's saying. Shadona? Um, I think that's a hint for me, y'all. <laughs> 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 I think that's a good idea. Um, and I think John does that throughout. You're going to see John take some interludes and some breaks and praise breaks and come back to some things, and that is a good way to go about it. You have somebody else? Well, what you just said, Hiram, is what makes it so difficult for me. Is, is, that, is that literally I saw that, or is it hypothetical? Uh, you know, I can, when we take the Lord's Supper, I sit there and vision. In my mind, I can see the, the cross and, and the crucifixion, and <coughs> this, you know, Christ being beaten, and I, I see all that in my mind, but that's not literal. That's what I read, and that's the picture I've drawn in my mind. So and yet, though, Russell, without that, you couldn't properly protect the Lord's Supper or glean the richness from the Supper. And so if we do it then, we've got to do it here. Our entire Christian lives really are in some ways, yes, the Bible is historical fact. There really was a man from Nazareth named Jesus who died and rose the third day, and yet we saw none of it. And we sing the song, we saw thee not. And so we do have to read the New Testament as a whole. It's more pronounced than Revelation, but we do have to visualize in our minds that which we can't see. And so I think that helps us with the book. And then learning to interpret the symbols. There's a lot of things about the numbers in the book of Revelation. And John does, look at this. Let's look at a few of these. Let me sh go to Revelation chapter one. And John does use a lot of symbols, but here's the thing. Sometimes John comes right out and tells you what the symbol is. So let's get somebody to read Revelation chapter one and verse 20. 
let's get somebody to read that one. Who will take that? I'm going to give out a few verses. Sign up for these. Revelation 120, Kevin. Revelation 5, 8. Revelation 5, 8. Okay. And then Revelation 19, 8. Steve, can you do that? Um, Robert, I drew a blank. That's your name. Okay. 120, 5, 8, 19, 8. And then Revelation 20 and verse 2. Who will take that? Revelation 20, Jeremy. Okay, so we got Kevin, Robert, Steve, and Jeremy. Revelation 120, listen to what John says. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Okay, the seven stars, what are those? Angels, of the seven churches. angels are messengers to the seven churches, and the seven lampstands? John tells you. So that one's like, we just crossed those off. All right, we don't have to guess. Forget commentators. John's telling me that one himself. What's the next one? Let's go to Revelation 5 8. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a heart and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Question What are the golden bowls full of incense? Prayers of the saints. So when you start seeing this imagery about incense, John's saying, hey, this represents the prayer. You don't need it. John tells you. John gives you that one. Okay, let's do the next one. 19.8. Revelation 19. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So when John, John's going to start at the end of the book describing two women. One, the harlot from Babylon, and the other, the bride of Christ. That's where this all is going. John deals in contrast. Two kingdoms, two women, two realities. But towards the end, he's going to say, there's one woman. She looks beautiful, but she's marred and ugly, and God's going to destroy her. But another one, she's beautiful. According to John in Revelation 19, 8, what is the fine linen for this beautiful woman? What is, what are, what is that? Righteous. The righteous deeds of the saints. And then in verse 9, he's going to say there's going to be the marriage supper, and those that are invited are blessed. And so John tells you what those righteous deeds represent. And then chapter 20 and verse 2. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. In the book of Revelation, who's the dragon? <clears throat> Help what John tells you. If we can interpret some of the symbols, I think it will help us. And if we take the freebies that John gives us, we'll get to the ones where John doesn't tell us much, but I think taking what we do know, Ronnie talked about the New Testament, Kathy talked about the Old Testament. If we take what John gives us, okay, seven lampstands, seven candlesticks, I know what that is. The deeds of the saints, I've got that. And just accept what John gives and then work through the others. Kevin, did you have something? Yeah. What do you think that knowing the history at the time that this is being written of those people, also It'll help us a great deal. And if I can talk a little faster, we're going to get to some of it. But yes, I think that's right. Knowing the history, knowing the background, their setting. Um, I think without that, we can still learn a great deal. But it is definitely enhanced when we realize what were they going through. And then we'll know why John not only said what he said, but why did he mention things in the way that he did? Okay. All right. Now let's get to the background and then we may get to. Oh, and then learning how the book is organized. Yeah, I do need to do this one. This is just a brief outline for the book of Revelation. There are a lot of these, but here's the one I, I got for you. There's a prologue, which is the introduction, Revelation 1, 1 through 3. John sets up the book. He says, hey, here's what's going on. And then John deals in this series of sevens. There are seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven great signs, seven bowls of wrath, seven mess messages of final judgment, seven last things, an epilogue, and a partridge, and a pear tree. That's what John gives you <laughs> for the outline of the book. And I think knowing the outline of the book, Shadona talked about Acts in the book of Revelation, setting it up in these scenes. If you know what's coming, if you see six seals, you know a seven's coming, and John's circling right back around to something else, of which there'll be seven. And then there'll be seven more. Now, here's the question, and we'll talk about this. Are these seven different, seven different types of events? Or is John talking about the same seven things, seven different ways throughout the book? That's for us to determine. But if you learn the way John sets up the book, he's just rolling in cycles. When you get to six, every time just about you get to the sixth whatever, John stops and has a praise break. So he'll start here with the seven seals, but then he'll stop in chapter six. And let me show you a picture of the martyr saints praising God, Revelation 7, the 144,000 and the innumerable multitude. Then he drops the seven and he picks up, he goes six more, and then he stops in chapter 14. And there's another praise break with the 400. Why does John do that? He's going in cycles. Just a brief knowledge of the overview of the book, an outline of how John set things up, I think helps us. And so before we fast forward to the future, we should remember the purpose of the book is to live for Jesus in the present and that this was the purpose for the first Christians too. 
All right. Everybody good on that? We're good? Not yet. We get that. All right. Good. All right, now let's get to some of the background because Kevin's right. If we know some of what's going on, it's going to help us in our study of the book. So let's start with this. Who wrote the book of Revelation? John. How do you know that? He says it in all these verses, right? Revelation 1 1. He says it several times. Um, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to show to his servants the things which must soon take place. And then in verse 4, John to the seven churches that are in Asia. John describes himself. What do you know about John? He's an apostle. What else? Brother of? Oh, uh, no, not brother of Jesus. Brother in Christ, though. <laughs> James and Jude would be brothers of Jesus. What do we know? He was the brother of James, somebody said, right? Brother of James. What happened to James? Acts chapter 12, Herod, you remember? Beheaded. Beheaded. Does John know about suffering? Does John know that it will cost you to follow Jesus? His brother died early on. You remember Matthew 20, their mother, Mother Zebedee comes to him, Zebedee's wife, and grant these two sons of mine to sit one on the right, the other on the left in your kingdom. Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. To give to the right and the left isn't mine to give, but it will be granted to those prepared from the Father. But you will be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. It happened to his brother right off. They're not 20 years into the church, and he's at his brother's funeral. John writes to people about enduring suffering, but John knows exactly what that's like. When he says, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord, Revelation 14, 13. I wasn't there, but I can't help but imagine he's thinking, just like my brother. John knows what it's like to suffer. We know about John. Uh, what else did John write, by the way? Gospel of John. That's a good one. John, what else? First, second, third John. That helps me because that tells me if John wrote John, first, second, and third John, he wrote four of the books of the New Testament. If I can work with those, I can't come to Revelation and say, well, now John's writing and I've got no clue of what's going on. It probably is more challenging, and it is. It is. There are things in Revelation I don't understand. I don't know. But John is the same John that wrote those other four books, and if we can work with those, then um, we can work with this. What was his experience as a disciple of Jesus? How is he described, especially in the Gospel of John? What is said about him? Jesus He's the disciple whom Jesus loved. He walked really closely with Jesus, and that made a difference. Okay, when was Revelation written? In the first century is a good answer. <laughs> so there are probably two major views and a slight third, and I, I'm going to give them to you, and then I'll tell you when I think it was written and why, and this will help with the background that Kevin's mentioning. So sometimes people go with a date before AD 70, and this was in the reign of the Emperor Vespasian, and the reason why, if you read from somebody or if you take the Vespasian area where this is when the book was written, those folks believe the whole book of Revelation is about the destruction of Jerusalem, which took place around AD 70. And the persecution of the church in the book of Revelation is by Jewish folks, and it's all about the temple, and that's what's going on. The focus for them is on the persecution. I don't take that view. We could give a lot of reasons why, but I would say one primary reason is I don't know how much that would directly affect the seven churches in Asia. John's writing to them about some things that are being experienced by them and by the broader church. And so just focusing on, and I know we make a big deal, by the way, about the destruction of Jerusalem, and Jesus does in Mark 13 and Matthew 24. But it's really not that important to people throughout the New Testament letters. Just read the New Testament letters and see how often they make a big deal about the destruction of, the, of Jerusalem. They really don't mention it as much as we think that this was this cataclysmic event for first century Christians. Jesus warns the Christians to get out, but the epistles don't spend a lot of time talking about this happening and when it's going to happen, though it did during the reign of Titus. The second one is less believed, and that's that it happened during the time of Nero in AD 54 and 68. But the date that I take is in the reign of Domitian, in the 90s, somewhere in there. Domitian reigned from 81 to 96. And this is the date I go with for several reasons. Number one, there's a church father by the name of Irenaeus, not in the Bible, not inspired, but lived about 80 years after these things took place. And this is what he says. He says, John saw the revelation, for it was not seen a long time ago, but also in our own generation toward the end of the reign of Domitian. So Irenaeus lived in 185. John lived in about the 90s. He's a lot closer than us. And he says, hey, y'all remember when that happened? John wrote about it. It wasn't too far away from us. And then he says, by the way, it was in the reign of Domitian. And so I would say he knows a little bit more about the time. But here's the other thing. Emperor worship is believed to have begun during the reign of Domitian. And it's a major emphasis throughout the book of Revelation. And so Domitian wanted to be worshiped as a god. Every year, people in the Roman Empire had to utter this 
phrase and to offer these sacrifices that the mission is Lord, but Christians were taught we could only say Christ is curious, Jesus is Lord. And so this idea of emperor worship, which I think deals is dealt with in Revelation 13 with the sea beast and some of the other things, I think that gives us the setting for what's going on in the book of Revelation. Emperor worship was a big deal. You couldn't buy or sell. There were things confiscated from Christians because of their failure to worship the emperor. And that's right in the time of Domitian. There are some verses. I'm going to just rattle them off. You can read these on your own, but I think they help with the context of emperor worship. Revelation 13, 4 through 8. Revelation 13, 15 and 16. Chapter 14, 9 through 11. Chapter 15 and verse 2. Chapter 16, verse 1. Chapter 19, verse 20. And chapter 20 and verse 4. Okay. Here's another thing. What was John's purpose in writing? Now, we do have 30 seconds to do this. Go to Revelation chapter 1. The bell's going to ring. Sorry. But <laughs> Revelation 1 at the end. John says, God made these things to show his servants the things which must what? Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. Soon take place. Look at Revelation 1.3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words and who keeps this for the time is near. And then if you go to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11. This is about the church in Philadelphia that says, I am coming soon. This is in the first century. All of these verses, we don't have time to read them all, but all of these verses emphasize that what John was writing at the time is at hand. Somebody says, yeah, but at hand could be any time. It could be now. It could be. No, John uses a word specifically that means the time is drawing near, like it's right up on us. And so whenever John was writing about <laughs> these folks, even all the way into the end in chapter 22, where that phrase comes up especially, I believe it was going to happen in their lifetime. John saying, when we read, we don't have a problem with the same word in Mark 1 15. Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it was near. It happened during their lifetime. Same thing here. Here's the last thing as we end. And that is, there's some major themes developed. And I'll talk about those next week before we get into chapter one. But your homework is to read Revelation chapter one. And if you want me to email you the questions, I'm going to leave a sheet of paper up here and you just write your email on the back. On Friday, Lord willing, I will email the questions out and they'll help us in our study for next week. But um, we'll talk about the themes developed in next week, right into chapter one. Know it was a lot of information today, a lot of overview. Um, we'll get more into the text next week and even take up Shadona's idea. We'll we'll have a play. Who wants to be the dragon? I don't know. We'll do what we can do. All right, thanks for a good Bible class and your contributions. Again, if you want me to email you the questions, you can just write your email in here. Oh, you got it. Thank you.